Welcome to our talk about the EDB Postgres Advanced Server, what's new. I'm going to do that together with my colleague, Rushab Latia. Uh, Rushab, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, so, I'm Rushab. Uh, I work as a Postgres SQL developer uh, as well as at Enterprise DB. Uh, I'm a director of product development, uh, basically, lead the Postgres SQL development team at uh, India Best. Uh, yeah, that's me. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Rusha. Um, and I'm in charge of uh, product development for Enterprise DB. So uh, Rusha and I work together with a number of other people on our development of PostgreSQL and EDB Postgres Advanced Server. Okay. So um, let me uh, let me dig into it here. So our agenda today is uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the new features. I'll give you a high level overview. Uh, we'll do a deep dive into partitioning, which we think uh, is one of the most interesting new features that uh, came available in Postgres 12 and 13. Um, and uh, we'll have a, um, a deep dive. We'll have a space for a Q&A afterwards. I want to point out a few resources that uh, we'd highly recommend. Uh, first, we have a large number of videos on the EDB Postgres uh, YouTube channel, so uh, please check those out. Um, then every second Monday, we have uh, the Postgres Pulse live sessions, which are a half-hour call-in show that uh, um, you know people like Bruce Momjin and uh, Vibor Kumar and one of our developer advocates lead. And then we have a large number of Postgres blogs and, um, um, and and tutorials that would give you very good insight into a lot of the material that we're now talking about. So please, please take advantage of all of that stuff um, to really understand what's new and, and how to use it, right? So let me talk about one of the most exciting things um, uh, that, that we see in Postgres's evolution. And it, it, I wanna emphasize this because uh, while benchmarks are all a little bit artificial and they don't always mean, they don't always apply to your specific use case, it's important that we all understand that the Postgres that we see today is not the Postgres that we remember from maybe four or five or 10 years ago when you may last have looked at it. I mean, in this benchmark that we published in January 2020, we're showing that for um, the PG Bench benchmark, um, we had an over 50% improvement in TPS, um, so transaction per second throughput in, uh, in just four years. That's one important thing. And the second thing is when you look at the shape of this curve, you can also see that the shape has changed significantly. Whereas Postgres, uh, and these are all done on the same, on exactly the same hardware and all the configurations are publicly available on our GitHub. Um, so you can see in this curve, where Postgres used to max out with, uh, you know, about 120 concurrent connections and then actually went down. So it was really critical that one could uh, understand where this knee in the performance curve was. This knee has moved much further and to the right and the down curve is, um, is, a, lot, is a lot less important. So key message here is Postgres has changed and improved tremendously over the last couple of years. But performance, TPS, is not everything. It's only one part of the equation. So today we're going to talk about key capabilities in, um, in EDB Postgres. Um, and uh, when I say EDB Postgres, I mean the superset of EDB Postgres Advanced Server and PostgreSQL. As you all know, that EDB Postgres Advanced Server is the Oracle compatible version of Postgres. It includes all the features of PostgreSQL. It's on the same release cycle as PostgreSQL, um, but it has certain additional capabilities, most of them known because of Oracle compatibilities. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about vacuum performance, uh, improvements in the vacuum space, uh, so improvements in security and consistency checking, um, data loading, and then Rushab is going to spend a lot of time talking about uh, the new capabilities in partitioning. It's not, this is not a complete and exhaustive list that would be kind of tiresome, um, but um, uh, you know, if you want the complete and exhaustive list of all the capabilities, please check out the release notes. Um, so 
Let me first talk about vacuum improvements. Vacuum and bloat is a, uh, is something that every DBA, every user knows that, uh, that requires some attention in, in, in Postgres and some really important work that has been done. And this is in, in the open source PostgreSQL is, um, um, we've, we've parallelized the, uh, the parallel vacuum, the, the vacuum work for indexes. Okay. So that indexes can now be handled through multiple workers that uh, that chomp through the index bloat in parallel. Um, here we've done a little benchmark, and again, this benchmark is published on our website, showing you know what is the impact and how much faster uh, bloat. In this case, we created a significant artificial bloat of about uh, 50 million in-place uh, update transactions. And then we show that, you know, if you do this without parallelism, it takes a little over an hour to chomp through that bloat. Whereas if you do it and add seven parallel workers, so a total of eight workers, you're really getting this done in about 16 minutes. So that's very, very significant uh, uh, to, to help you go through large amounts of bloat. Then another really important, uh, maybe less obvious uh, improvement is auto vacuum for append only transactions. Now you may wonder, append only, what kind of bloke would that create? Well, the really important thing is um, uh, the, the, the statistics are being re recalculated. So then now automatically being recalculated all the time, kept up to date for uh, append only tables, which in IoT type of workloads where you just append a lot of time series data um, is really important so you, to maintain your performance automatically. Okay. Um, so, and then improvements around security and consistency. Um, LibPQ now uses channel binding. So uh, there's a really good way now to make sure that man in the middle attacks don't happen anymore, or I mean, are prevented. I'm not aware of uh, of a successful one, but again, you know, when you're in the security space, you're you're very concerned always about staying one step ahead of uh, uh, some potential malfeasance. And libpq channel binding is uh, is really important there. Then there's been a utility called PG Cat Check that has been around for quite a while. Robert Haas and team developed it. It is again on the EDB um, uh, GitHub. Uh, publicly available. It works for PostgreSQL and EDB Postgres Advanced Server. It was developed to help you diagnose uh, catalog corruptions. Now, Rushab and his team have added a really important new capability um, that, that deals with the could not open file issue, which can happen if the underlying data file that is associated with a relation or a table for some reason has disappeared, has been deleted, has not been moved properly, or has become corrupted. So we highly recommend the, uh, that DBAs have that, uh, have PG Cat Check, use it to uh, uh, detect any kind of system catalog corruption, and then uh, also run it regularly to make sure that not well, we didn't have for some reason uh, a file that would have disappeared. So this has been a, a frequent issue that customers have asked for. And uh, here I have a little bit more uh, more details in it. Um, so so basically, you, as a new flag called select from relations, um, and that will make sure that uh, it checks the underlying tables and make sure that uh, that the first file of that relation is accessible and, uh, and, and can be read. It's very easy to use, very, very little performance impact. It does not, uh, it does not invalidate the cache when it tries to do that. So we'd highly recommend to run that periodically to, uh, to avoid, uh, an issue where Postgres is trying to access a file and then for some reason identifies that, ooh, the file is missing. Um, okay, EDB loader, um, a capability to, large, to load large amounts of data, very comparable to Oracle's loader. Um, and we've added a capability where um, it now handles duplicate rows. So, so uh, uh, um, duplicate rows are now handled in a graceful way. So if there is a, uh, um, an insert, insert conflict, um, then now instead of the whole operation stopping the way it would be in a purely transactional environment, what we now have, we make sure that, you know, if there is, if you set the, if you set the, the flags correctly, then, um, 
the offending record gets written into a bad file, but the whole process continues. So you can, you can decide later on what to do with this one offending record. That's really, really useful because customers use this to, to bring in very large amounts of data where we don't want just to, to, to abort and, uh, and, and, and restart. Okay. So before I turn it over to, to Rushab here, we're going to spend more time talking about uh, partitioning. Partitioning has been undergoing tremendous amounts of changes in, uh, in Postgres. As you may know, um, older versions of Postgres used inheritance-based partitioning, which was, um, you know, nice, but not that, uh, not that efficient, especially if you had several hundred uh, uh, partitions at the same time. Um, so declarative partitioning uh, in PostgreSQL was introduced in version 10. Um, EDB Advanced Server had, has had declarative partitioning for much longer, and we have converted our engine to now use the standard PostgreSQL partitioning while maintaining the syntax of Oracle compatibility. So what we'll talk about today is, or what Rusha will talk about is, is capabilities to automatically create specific partitions as more data comes in. And again, this is, these are really important use cases for IoT type scenarios where, um, you know, you may be partitioning by day and data flows in and you want to automatically create the next partition for the next day, et cetera. Okay. And doing that, without significant amounts of conflict in uh, um, in the database. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Rusha. Hey, thanks, Mark. Uh, yeah, the partition capability is uh, here, and uh, Focus has introduced the declarative partition from uh, version 10, and uh, now we are at version 13, and so far, it the journey for partitioning development has been great in community. Uh, started with a single column key partition, then multi column key partition, some features like default partition, runtime pruning, uh, performance enhancement feature like partition wise join or the partition level aggregation has been uh, getting into the declarative partition. And uh, that makes the partitioning uh, really strong. Now, EPAS partitioning is based on declarative partition now. Uh, so apart from the all the feature which community provides, uh, EPAS partitioning has uh, uh, support for the Redwood compatibility uh, syntax. So if someone is coming from that side of the world and they do not do not need to learn the new syntax, uh, they can still use the Redwood syntax and uh, get the uh, partitioning done in Postgres SQL. Uh, so apart from that, there is the exchange partition, split partition, add partition sort of features which is available in EPAS. Uh, partitioning is good, like it, it, it kind of uh, allow you to distribute your data in, in a good manner, but there is also uh, some kind of management which require to uh, maintain the partitioning. Uh, so as Mark was saying, like if your uh, data is something which is uh, distributed on a day, uh, then every uh, time the new day comes, you have to create a new partition to make sure that those particular data get uh, transferred to the new partition. Uh, now, those kind of things is something which uh, comes under the management of partition. Uh, what EPAS is trying is, is trying to uh, create those things uh, automatic, right? What it means is like, one need not need not need to be worry about uh, creating a new partition, uh, and that gets uh, created on the fly. Uh, that will basically uh, easy way to basically manage the partitioning uh, uh, partitioning scheme. Uh, it's also easy in terms of if you want to convert your known partition table uh, to the partition table. Uh, suppose. Uh, in, in the if you don't have this kind of capability and you want to convert your existing known partition table uh, to the partition table, then what you need to do is first identify the key for the partition uh, table and then need to look around the data to understand the distribution scheme. Uh, but in case of automatic partition, you don't need to be very much about that. Only thing you require is just to create a one partition 
and start loading the data. And uh, at the end of the data loading, you will realize that that won't distribute it in uh, uh, separate partitions. So this is something uh, can be really useful in that area as well. Uh, so what I will be trying to cover is uh, we'll be going through the each automatic partition uh, facilities which has been added in EPAS. Uh, EPAS is basically Enterprise TV Advanced Server. Uh, so I'll be trying to cover internal partition, automatic partition, and uh, partition and the subpartition numbers, which is basically useful for uh, for the hash partitioning. Okay. Uh, here we go. So internal partition. Internal partition is uh, basically uh, an extension to the range partition. Uh, creates a new partition automatically when the particular data or the tuple doesn't get fit into the existing partition scheme. Uh, one need to provide an interval clause uh, with the part create partition so that it can uh, that interval clause will decide the range size for the new partition which uh, supposed to get created automatically. Uh, with this, it also provides a syntax, uh, alter syntax, basically where you can convert the, your existing, existing partition into the internal partition. And one can also decide to disable the internal partition uh, at any time if, if they feel like they don't need that. So I'll, I'll walk through some examples which will uh, give you more uh, idea about the thing. So here in example, I am creating the order table. I mean, throughout this presentation, I'll be using a order table as an example because I I think that basically get uh, things treated really well. Uh, so here in this case, uh, I'm creating a, a table order with uh, this is that's the range partition and the partition key here is a order date. Uh, and if you uh, notice here. The bold part in the slide, uh, in the slide is interval close. Uh, I will come to that later. And apart from that bold close, the, everything uh, in the partition syntax is same as the normal range partition syntax. So in, in this uh, example, I'm creating one partition uh, for the order table, uh, which basically accept the data uh, with the order date value less than first May. Uh, now, if I insert the data, let's say, uh, with the order date is 24th Feb, and later I'm doing the select. In, the, in this select, I'm using that table OID colon colon range class. Uh, if you use this clause uh, with the select on a partition table, that will give you an idea that uh, your particular tuple belongs to which particular partition. So here in this case, you can see that there's the order underscore P1. That means the P1, uh, the record has been uh, went into the P1 partition. So far, so good, right? Uh, now, if I'm trying to insert a data uh, with the order date is 23rd June, uh, now if you remember the part, the part create partition thing, uh, I had one partition which is value less than first May. So in the normal case, if it's not an internal partition, you would have uh, got an error saying like no partition of relation order found for a particular row. Uh, but with the internal partition, this insert will run successfully. Why? Like where my tuple went, uh, does it went into the wrong partition? Now let's try to do the select and see where it is. Uh, when you do the select, you will notice there is new partition which got created, which is orders underscore C's and some random number with it. So what exactly it does is when you provided the interval clone, it will try to identify the internal range. And when you have a new table which doesn't get fit into the existing partition uh, schema, it, it, it will try to create a new partition uh, for that particular tuple. Uh, again, one might raise a question that there will be a locking issue, et cetera. But underneath uh, this uh, automation of automatic partitioning system, use the uh, autonomous transaction. What it means, it's like it's an independent transaction uh, than the, what the current transaction is running. 
So this create table gets created under the automation transaction. So one need not need to be worried about the locking as well. Uh, similarly, a stole one can use the alter table syntax to basically uh, set uh, uh, set the internal partition again to the non internal partition, or one can also use alter table order set interval with uh, blank brackets. What it means is will remove the uh, interval partitioning for from the existing partitioning. Uh, so next is the automatic partition. Uh, this is similar to internal partition, but this is uh, for the least partitioning. Now, what it does is like when you specify the partition as automatic partition, it will create a new partition for the any new distinct value for the particular least partitioning key. Uh, uh, one can also enable the automatic partitioning on an existing table using the utter table command. And same way, one can also disable the automatic partitioning on the existing uh, automatic partition. Uh, we'll walk through some examples to uh, give you more understanding about this. Yeah. So here again, I'm using the order table as an example. Uh, so I have a table order, but now the partition key is country code, and I'm using it as a least partition. Uh, initially, with the create partition, I'm creating a two partition, one for the country code ID, that's India, and another is for the country code USA. So once the table gets created and you see the described result, you can see there is a two partition available there. Now I'm trying to uh, insert a tuple, basically, which doesn't get treated into the existing partition. And when you do that, uh, once it's successful and you describe the table again, you can see that new table uh, orders underscore seeds with some random, random number uh, both created automatically. So uh, in, in an answer, like user need not need to be worried about like uh, the errors uh, or have to think about like whether the particular tuple will get fit into the existing partition or no. So this can be really useful in IoT sort of applications of the system where the data is more and you want to uh, manage the data in a proper partitioning way. Automatic hash partitioning. Hash partitioning is basically different from least and range. Uh, here, like in a hash partitioning, generally, uh, hash partitioning, one cannot uh, get into the error where they, they see that particular tuple doesn't get fit into the existing partition scheme. Uh, but the, this new clause which has been added, which basically provides uh, one can use like partition, then number and the storing clones. What basically it does is like it creates the hash partition uh, automatically for you. Now, if you are aware of a uh, uh, declarative uh, partitioning syntax for the hash partition, uh, you might found that it's kind of a complex because you have to use the modulus and reminder while creating the partition for the hash partition. Uh, but here with this simple syntax, the only thing you need to tell is like how many partitions you want and you want to store those particular partition in which table space. Uh, so this storing clause is optional. If you don't provide that, that uh, tables, uh, the new partition will get created into the default table space. Uh, so in this particular example, uh, I'm creating a table uh, saying that partition by has on column one and two. And later on, I'm specifying that partitions two. What it means is like I want two partitions for this particular table. And I want it to be uh, stored, one partition to be stored in table space one and another in table space two. Uh, so after doing the create, when you describe the table, you can see that there is a number of partition as two. And the next thing, uh, so here I'm using the Redwood uh, view, the user tape partitions, basically, which will give, you, give me an output about like this table, uh, how many partitions this table has. So if you see, there is a two partition which got created and uh, also selected the table space name and which got distributed to the separate table space has been specified into the create table. Now this, this part of uh, the similar clause can be used for the sub partitions. Uh, but when, when it comes to the sub partitions, this become a more powerful uh, because uh, let's go through the example. This will give you an idea. 
Uh, here again, I'm using the order table. Uh, in the at the first level, I have the partition by list, and uh, I'm using the country code as a partition key, and I'm marking that as a that's as an automatic partition. And at the next level, I'm having the sub partition by hash. Uh, that's all order that, and I'm specifying the sub partitions as three. For the partition, uh, I have initially created one partition uh, that. Uh, we accept the uh, orders from the country code USA and IND. Right? Uh, once this is done, and if I do the select on user tape sub partitions, uh, we can see that there is one partition, P1, and the three sub partition both created automatically for that particular partition. Uh, that's because of the sub partition clause which we have, which we used. Okay, now let's try to insert a table on that particular tape uh, on that particular table uh, with a partition key uh, country code UK. Now, in case of normal thing, you might would have uh, end up with an error that this tuple doesn't get fit into the partition. But if you remember, we had specified the automatic keyword uh, while creating this table. So what it will do is it will create an automatic partition. And because we have used the sub partitions number close, it will also create uh, automatic sub partitions for that particular uh, newly created partition. That's something really cool you can get out of this automatic partitioning feature. Uh, now, if I do the select from user tape sub partition, you can see that P1 has a three sub partitions. And apart from P1, there is one more partition name you can see, C and some random number. It also has a three new sub partitions. So this is another part of this uh, hash partitioning thing, uh, where one can also uh, enable or disable the uh, sub partition counts or the partition counts using the alter table syntax. Uh, now there might happen that you want to create a new partition on that existing ordered partition, and uh, now it, this time you want the sub partition as uh, ten. So you can also do it using like alter table add partition and values, and then you can provide the sub partition close with the alter table as well. So what this uh, what I'm trying to tell is like you can use these templates with old partition commands like alter table add table split partitioning uh, ABC. So this is what uh, I had to, uh, in terms of uh, automatic partition. Next in the slide is the partition wise join. Uh, this is something which got introduced on PG11. Uh, by default, this is controlled by the GURF name enable partition wise join. By default, this is set to all. Uh, that's because uh, it's been observed that the few, the, for the few workload, uh, the planning time would increase with uh, enabling the partition wise join. So that's by default, it's set to four. Oh. Uh, but if you think that your query or the your workload will get benefit with benefited out of this, uh, you can choose to set it to on. Uh, what this basically feature does is it here is partition wise join. Uh, when you when you have a table, let's say two partition table uh, with the same partitioning bound, uh, then in the normal join scenario, what happens is like once. So one table gets selected, and then the from the join on another partition table. Uh, and with this part, and if you would have enabled this partition wise join, uh, what it did is like it rather than uh, joining on the whole table, it decides to join on uh, each partition, which will give the huge performance benefit and uh, very run quite uh, very get benefited with the performance uh, with this feature. Uh, so and when this was added on V11, that that had a limitation like uh, both uh, uh, it, both the partition should be have the same bound for the partition. But in V13, this has been announced, and that they have removed this restriction uh, of having the same bound for the partitions. Uh, so more detail about the declarative partition and the features in the Postgres SQL community around the partitioning. You can uh, attend or watch the uh, talk 
by my colleague Amit Lamukote, uh, who will walk through the table, uh, the part, table partitioning in PostgreSQL and how far we have come. Uh, Amit Lamukote is also a primary uh, developer for the partitioning in the PostgreSQL community. So I suggest to join this talk uh, to get more idea and understanding about the declarative partitioning. In the last slide, I tried to uh, compile this slide by adding a kind of a feature which has been brought in into EPAS 13 feature, EPAS 13. Uh, there has been a lot of features uh, development which is done and uh, it would be kind of impossible to walk through each in this presentation. Uh, there are, uh, we have added the using index clause uh, into the create table and alter table. There has been a parallel and no parallel option has been added to the create table. Uh, there are a few other features like announcement into the existing new, uh, DBMS package and as well as UTL packages. Uh, we have now supporting the forward declaration of function and procedures inside the package body. Uh, a lot more capability added uh, around the Redwood compatible views, uh, enhancements on the ATP loader and the, uh, the multi-insert uh, with the ATP loader tool. Uh, so you can visit the website, get the release note of PG, uh, EPAS 13 and we'll uh, see all these features listed there. And if someone has anything or any questions around it, uh, get in touch with uh, uh, support on the enterprise TV. All right, yeah, thank you. Uh, Mark, can you? Yeah, sure. So thanks, thanks, Rusha, for uh, walking us in detail through the partitioning. And I would be, I would re really encourage everybody to uh, to take a good good look at the partition capabilities because they have changed very, very significantly, and also the performance of partitioning in. Uh, uh, in Postgres has changed very significantly. So uh, just to, just to summarize, I mean, Postgres is becoming a lot faster and has become a lot faster. I mean, it always was very good. So I'm not saying that uh, that a couple of years ago it really wasn't all that great. Since the work that was done in uh, Postgres 9.2 around scalability to higher core counts. Really, things have dramatically improved year over year. I just want to encourage everybody who has looked at Postgres maybe a couple of years ago to look again because, uh, again, uh, TPS has improved significantly. Manageability, such as uh, a vacuum, has really improved significantly. Um, and then, uh, you know, the capabilities that uh, Rushab and I just walked through, especially the, the partitioning and then the manageability around the partitioning, which uh, Rushab really emphasized. Uh, those are absolutely things worth, uh, worth looking at and um, uh, taking a, a detailed look when you, when you architect your next, uh, your next application. Okay, so now I want to leave it over to uh, two questions. Wow, that was uh, that was a serious amount of information there. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how many of you were in Magnus's talk from this morning about Postgres 13, but he went through like a huge list of things that the community was adding in 13, and now we got this, which is a huge amount of stuff. Advanced server, it's, it's a little overwhelming. I, I can see it a little bit from the chat. I'm, I was a little overwhelmed. Um, Rushab, could you just to just to kind of jump in the one specific question we got is understanding exactly what is different in EPAS in terms of partitioning versus uh, the community? Because I know Mark said that we're now based on the community's partitioning code, but there's a bunch of things, and you outlined some of the things that were only in EPAS and some of the things that were in the community for 13. Can you just give us an overview of exactly what is in EPAS for partitioning for 13? Uh, sure. It's different from the community, sure. Yeah, so, I mean, overall, uh, the underlying implementation is on declarative partitioning, but what EPAS is trying is trying to add uh, more manageability, manageability capability like automatic partitioning, and uh, apart from that, that's also taking care of the Oracle uh, syntax, partitioning syntax. Now, if you know like declarative partition syntax is different from what Redwood supports, so uh, EPAS is also trying to accept those syntaxes and underlying its 
basically creating the declarative partitioning. Uh, so yeah, those are few kind of uh, differences and V13 uh, and plus V12 as well, like both has been added for uh, automation around the partition. Yeah, I think that's what I suspected, but it's good to have that confirmed. Thank you. Um, really interesting question that I don't know the answer to that I do see. Will partition-wise join work with bound variables? And I know that we we added partition in Postgres 12. We enabled bound variables to, to participate in partition pruning. Um, I, I assume partition-wise join also does that, but you know the answer to that? I don't yeah i mean i can imagine it should work but to be frank i i haven't tested so yeah we don't see around test it gotcha um another question that came in very early was um was related to z heap because obviously there, there's a lot of discussion around that and hopes because mark talked about performance mark would you like to address that yeah so z heap uh, i got some uh, bad news there is uh Right now, so currently we've decided to focus on other priorities for the time being. So I think there have been such tremendous performance enhancements around vacuum, like the parallel index vacuum um, and other techniques that uh, that basically we've decided for right now to uh, put that, post that project on hold. Okay, so at least we have an official word on that one. So uh, that's good to see. Um, uh, in terms of PG Cat Check, and uh, uh, I think I can answer this myself, but I'll throw it to <laughs> I'll throw it to uh, Rishab. PG Cat Check does more than really just check for the existence of files in the file system, right? It actually goes and looks at the system catalogs and makes sure that they are in a sane uh, structure. Is that correct? Uh, not exactly. Like it basically, what it does is like go through the catalog and try to uh, uh, perform a select with limit zero. So basically, it just let you know that whether if this particular relation is accessible, uh, if the file is missing or the file has a permission issue or okay. anything around that. Okay, gotcha. Great. Um, another thing, Mark, I think you talked about EDB loader, and the question was um, in terms of handling conflicts, and you said that was improved in 13. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something you can figure in Postgres Conf or you do it somewhere else? I think it's in Postgres Conf. There's a handle conflicts, I think, is uh, is what the variable. No, no, it's not in Postgres Conf. It's when you uh, when you give the uh, the EDB loader its parameter file when you parameterize the spec file. The file yeah, spec file. That's yeah. when you set up a handle conflict. So it's not it's not set up at the server level. It's set up at the individual uh, load command level, and then when handle conflicts is set, then the records with conflicts will go into the bad file. Um, okay, just reminding everybody that's coming in thirteen, and please use the loader client with the right load with the right uh, uh, EPAS server. Right? Don't don't use a new client with the old server. It might start, but it might not work. That's I gotcha, gotcha. Um, I was wondering who has uh, who would like to take a question about uh, the use of global indexes or the, the need for global indexes. I think that's a that's a great need, um, and it often comes up, but it's a very very hard problem that uh, um, you know we're, we we don't have a plan date for solving that problem on the roadmap. Where Rusha, maybe you want to comment on that. It's, it's been a hard problem as stated, Mark, and there has been a lot of discussion around the community regarding this feature. And I guess Mark is also involved in a few of those, uh, sorry, Bruce is also involved in a few of the discussion. Uh, yet there is a vibe of implementing and everyone seems like it's a good feature and it's required feature for Postgres SQL. And, but in terms of when it will be there, that something is not clear. Yeah, I, I recently did a blog entry or, or, or I'm putting out a blog entry about global indexes coming up where uh, you're right, the use case, um, it, it, global indexes typically have a big downside because they can become really large and contentious. Um, so you don't, Postgres kind of has other ways of doing it for a lot of use cases. And there's only like one or two remaining ones where you really can use, you know, really need them. 
Um, and I, I do have a blog entry coming out about that. Um, so I've been studying that. It's it's kind of interesting, and we may get there someday, but you're right, it's not on anyone's roadmap. Um, Rushab, there was an interesting question. I, I have not heard this question before uh, about partitioning. They said, what if I want to merge all the partitions to a base table by removing all the partitions? Is that something that we have a fee? I don't know how to do that or why you'd want to do that, actually. Yeah, actually, why you want to do that, that's something interesting question. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I mean, to work around that, one can always do like create table A, select star from the partition, and they will get a new table that doesn't have partitioning scheme, and later on, drop the whole partition scheme table. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, the last last question I saw with Mark was related to performance. They're asking, would I see the same performance in Postgres 9.3 as I would in 9.5? Now, that's obviously a very specific question, but uh, overall, um, what is the what is the trajectory of performance over, I guess, the past five or ten years in Postgres? Well, I, think, even I, I think they should do the, like the first or let's say recent big step was when uh, when Postgres learned to take advantage of more of more cores. And I believe that was in nine one and nine two, right? That was like a, a huge step forward where uh, Robert was significantly involved in in, in, in in making that happen. And since then there has been I think improvement in almost every um, in almost every release. Um, you know, as what I call the knee the knee has been driven upwards and to the right. I mean, there is still um, in, in many workloads a, a, a scenario where when you exceed the number of concurrent sessions that you will see performance drop down. But there's been so much work uh, on removing locks, et cetera. And I believe some of that work has been happening between 9.3 and 9.5. Um, so you should also see performance improvement there, but if you're thinking about going from nine three, nine three, I mean, man, go all the way. Go, go, go to go to eleven or twelve, right? I mean, why stop at nine five? Um, there's been such significant performance enhancements after that, as uh, as we showed on that slide. Definitely, you know, go all the way. I mean, I understand why people don't want to go with a top one release. That I get it, but uh, twelve has been out now for a year or almost a year, and and working really well. Go to not go to twelve. Yeah, I mean, you know, just to be a little more gee, we wish we had it mode. You know, we did have a feature that we hope to get into thirteen, which would even give us better yeah. scaling for very high connection counts, and that will come in fourteen. I'm almost sure. Mm -hmm. So, I guess the 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 real takeaway is that this is not your grandfather's database, right? I mean, every year you're getting. These major, major, you know, my head spinning from the Magnus thing, and now we're doing this. Uh, there's just so much that happens in a year. It's not like you're on a three, five year sort of release cycle, mm -hmm. and and you know the database focuses on one thing for those five years, and then mm -hmm. another thing for the next five years. Uh, this is really, I think, the strength of open source that there's just so much going on in so many directions. Some of its performance, some of its usability, some of its scaling some of it is cloud some of it is administration some of it is developer some of it is data warehouse uh, and every year you're making advances so yeah you're certainly missing a lot uh if mm -hmm. you're not able to get up on some of these current releases the big complaint i've had people said stop stop these updates you know because you know i feel like you know maybe one year i can skip but by the second year there's two years of stuff that they're just salivating over and uh, you know they've got to they've got to do the upgrade or, or they're going to drive themselves crazy. So um, anyway, it's a great place to be. I want to thank you, gentlemen, for uh, for giving a very clear explanation. I know it's hard to take a whole year and scrunch it down, especially in this environment. But did a great job, and I know people found the uh, session very helpful. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.